COVID-19, a study in complexity science and prediction. My name is Stuart Kaufman, age 80. I trained in medicine at the University of California in San Francisco about 50 years ago. I'm a MacArthur Fellow. I'm a Fellow of the Royal Society of Canada. I've published around 350 or 400 articles, six books and have several patents. I was on the faculty at the University of Pennsylvania in the Department of Biochemistry and Biophysics. I want to talk to us today about COVID-19. There are really two essential ideas that I think are not well known that I want to get across. We all know that we are using social distancing in the United States, in the UK, Europe and elsewhere to try to stop the spread of the virus. The first thing that I want to state and make clear is that it works, but if we do social distancing not sufficiently, for example, at 50 or 60 or 70 percent, it does not work, but over 80 percent, it does work. More precisely, there's a sudden jump as we increase social distancing from below some level to above some level, where social distancing then becomes effective. In Australia, it looks like that number is 80 percent effect is effective. 70% and less is not. I want to explain why that sudden jump happens. It's perfectly well known. The second thing is overwhelmingly important. I will be showing you in a short moment uh, results from Dr. Gabor Vate, a physicist complexity expert in Budapest at Utvis University, about what has happened in China and what is happening in Italy. Here's the basic thing. If we do nothing to socially isolate, uh, COVID-19 will spread and grow exponentially fast. It will just go and keep going up. If we do social isolation at the level that's effective, COVID-19 will increase and then it will level off and this disease will stop spreading. Mathematically, that's going from an exponential to what's called a logistic uh, response. This is happening now in China. It's happening in Italy. We can make it happen in the United States. If we get control of COVID-19 and the outbreaks slow and stop, as they have in China and in Hong Kong, we haven't won yet. Already there's evidence that post shutdown in Hong Kong, the disease is starting to spread again. We will not solve this for a long time until we have a vaccine and the population of humanity is well vaccinated. The next thing I want to tell us about is a study that was done at Imperial College in London by Ferguson et al. Uh, March 16th. Uh, they estimate for the UK and the US that if nothing is done and the disease spreads exponentially, in England about 500,000 people will die. In the United States, 2.2 million people will die. There are 7.8 billion of us. In the worst case, when this spreads, a very approximate number is that on the order of 50 to 55 million people could die. To scale this for us all, the World War II saw 40 million people die. It is imperative that we understand that with sufficient social isolation, so the disease switches from exponential to logistic and saturates, we can dramatically drop the death rate from something like 50 million to very much less than that. I'll, I'll get to it in a moment. This is figure two in the Ferguson study, and the different curves are showing the effects of different degrees of social isolation from closing schools to people staying at home to shutting down different organizations and so on. And again, this is dates from March 20th, April 20th, May 20th, and so on. The red line is is emergency bed critical care units in England. It's a flat line. If the curve goes above the flat line, hospitals will be overwhelmed and they will not find beds, they will not find uh, uh, oxygen, they will not find people able to take care of them. In short, this is the fear that our medical health care system in England in this case will be overwhelmed. Notice where the red line is. 
the message is that we can bring the curve down significantly, their study shows, and lower the peak and delay it if we use all the social isolation mechanisms that we have. Well, that's happening right now in Europe. Uh, England has gone to lockdown, perhaps because the Prime Minister, Boris Johnson, saw the study uh, of the group in Imperial. Coming back to our president, there is Easter, that's England. What happens if we do nothing? Well, it's somewhere up here. With hospitals overwhelmed, the disease spreading, we are at an extraordinarily dangerous moment. It is time, for example, for the governors in the United States to have their hands on these two studies, for everybody in Congress to have their hands on these two studies, Anthony Fauci almost certainly knows of these two studies, or does know of these two studies. I'm now going to show you Gabor Bate's analysis that came out two or three days ago, looking at the actual uh, events in China and now in Italy. So what Bate did is he looked at what happened in Hubei uh, province in China, and he is plotting on the y-axis here the rate of spread of the virus per day. So it starts at 15%. That means that each day the number of infected, this is actually deaths, but it's the same thing, the number of infected is going up by 15%. But what is happening, which is the huge hope, is that as the disease spreads, because it's now logistic and it's spreading in isolated pockets, the rate of spread of the disease slows from 15% to 10%. I'm now going to show you the same results uh, for daily growth rate of deaths uh, as a function of the cumulative number of deaths in Italy. And we're seeing the same thing. It starts in Italy spreading at about 25% a day, and it gradually trends downward in that data, as you can see, so that by in this case, 2,500 deaths. What a horrible thing to be using as a marker. It's dropped from 25% to 15% spreading per day. Uh, that is, again, because this is now logistic, because there's sufficient social isolation to, to stop the propagation of the disease exponentially. Now, an extremely crude calculation, and please understand how crude this is. The U.S. population is 330 million. Italy is about 65 or 70 million. So we're about six times the size of Italy. Just as the first really simple guess, really simple, first guess, if 6,000 people will die in Italy, six times that, the number scaling for the population of the United States is about 36,000 people will die. That's hideous. If we do nothing, it's 2.2 million people will die. What I've just said assumes that we can do social distancing at such a point that the disease doesn't spread. We have a theory uh, from Mikhail Prokopenko in Australia saying that social distancing of 80% works and 70% doesn't. This is my friend Stephen Guerin. Uh, he has built massive simulation gear for lots of kinds of things and is acting on behalf of the state of New Mexico with respect to COVID-19. Stephen, please go ahead. Uh, at the invitation of Stu, where we're gonna talk about phase transitions in models. And we're gonna use a metaphor today about how uh, an epidemic is, is not unlike a, a, a fire model. So if you think of a, a, a fire, so when we hit, you hear about SIR in the news, right? So it has three, a, a person can be in three states. They can be susceptible well, to the disease, uh, they and spreading to their neighbor, uh, or they can be recovered and uh, somewhat immune and non, no longer contagious and can be freely moving uh, in society. Well, in fire, we kind of talk about the same thing. The contagion is very much like this, where the, the flame is actually actively spreading to its neighbors, uh, which is we call you know the fuel or vegetation. So fuel is very much like the susceptible people. Uh, the infected is very much like the, fl uh, the flame, and the recovered is very much like the black. What we're going to look at today is phase transitions in these systems. And phase transitions, you may be familiar from, uh, from science, when, um, say, a liquid goes to a solid or a, a liquid goes to a gas. 
you know, as you change the temperature, we talk about the phase that the system is in. Is it a gas or a solid? And so by analogy, we're going to be talking about this in, in social distancing and isolation. So I'm going to give the visual analogy here with a fire. And think of the density of the fuel as these green dots. So that's a very dense uh, system here. So this is a very, very simple model, but it communicates uh, a very com uh, complex idea. Yeah. We can think of the green dots as trees, right? And the distance between the green dots is how far apart they are. Or we can think of them as people uh, and how far apart they are. And the spreading of the fire is analogous to the spreading of COVID-19. I'm going to start the virus or the fire on the left-hand side. And notice how that propagates in a very linear way. And, it's, and if I tried to stop, stop it here as a forest fire uh, fighter, I, I'm not going to catch it. In the, in the simulation that Stephen Guerin just ran, the trees are very close to one another, or the people are very close to one another. The fire spreads, the disease spreads. Now, Stephen is going to move the trees or the people further apart. For people, this is an increase in social distancing. And, and notice, as, I've come, as Stu is saying, as I've come down to 74%, it's still the same result. The percentage of burn is what we're going to care about, like how many people got the disease, right? In this case, it's practically every tree burned in this case. Stephen reduces the density of the simulation to show the halt of the propagation of fire or COVID-19. And I'm going to start it off, and there's not enough density for that uh, fire to take over. The contagion doesn't have enough probability to, to spread, right? So this is kind of when you have really good social distancing, the virus comes into your neighborhood but has nowhere to go, right? But notice, notice all the way down over here from zero, where you have really good social distancing, up to 50%, it burns itself out, right? But right around this 59% and the percolation theory, and it's, like, it's an idea that's universal across all kinds of systems, regardless if this is a, a forest fire or a, um, uh, an epidemic. But notice that here at the space transition, this is where the system is wildly chaotic and, and, and unpredictable. By chaotic, we mean if we change the initial start conditions, we can get wildly different impacts uh, on, the, on the spread pattern and the percent that burn. Uh, when we have a new virus, basically everybody is susceptible. You know, we don't have a lot of immunity. Once the virus starts to, we start to live with the virus, we're going to expect to be at this phase transition where you'll have many small outbreaks and just a few big ones. And I think if you look at Mikhail's work on Prokonyeko, the idea is that like, if, if you're doing social distancing, but you're not getting over the phase transition, you're wasting your time. And as we know, social distancing has huge economic costs, right? So we want to make sure we're doing it enough if we're going to do it. So and, and encouraging and knowing where that phase transition is important. So we want to look at the data and, and, and researchers around the world trying to figure that out. So this is absolutely essential. What this simple model shows is that there's a critical distance between the people or the trees where all of a sudden the disease does not spread or the fire does not spread. So this is the phase transition that Stephen was talking about. It's like water going to ice all of a sudden at 32 degrees Fahrenheit or zero centigrade, and that's a phase transition. So the message here is that in general, in something that propagates like a fire or a disease, there is a critical level of social distancing. Below that, the disease spreads and above it, it stops. In this simulation, we examine geographical data from New Mexico. So we're, here we're showing now, just moving that to a, an epidemic model. Now, with, now that you kind of understand the phase transition, well, now we'll call it about the probability of spreading. So, and, and that's important of how much uh, uh, personal protective equipment we get to our healthcare workers. So this is just a rough simulation of 2,100 healthcare workers distributed uh, throughout our patients here in the state. And you can see now if the probability of spreading is high, you can see we're above the phase transition and we're not, and our healthcare workers are going to get infected and spread it to each other and to their 
uh, and, and now we're going to not have healthcare workers, right? And you can see the red spreading, green are recovered, and blue are the susceptible. But you can see that no matter when we run this many times, we're going to get the same result. We're going to get everybody infected. But if I come down here with probability of spreading, now you're going to see that uh, we'll pretty much uh, die off. And so the phase transition again is tuning the probability of transmitting an infection from 10% to 20% to 30% to 50% and so on is the same thing as moving the people further apart and closer together. There's a threshold in which it spreads if you're a higher probability than that, but not if the system is below that. And I'll just make the point is what that percentage is, is dependent on what your social network is and, and many factors. What we can predict as complexity researchers is there's a phase transition in there. The role of the domain experts is to figure out the details about where that, uh, you know, of that particular problem. So we can't tell you right ahead of time what that percentage is, but we can tell you it's in there. And let's go find it together. The data from Australia, Mikhail uh, Prokopenko's study suggests from detailed simulations that this transition occurs between 70% and 80% social isolation. Is it safe to then lift the constraints and allow people to go back to work? Probably not, and this is equally essentially important. As I said, there's already signs, and in the newspaper, of a third wave in Hong Kong. Well, we'll find out soon enough if that's true, but if that's true, we are not going to just beat this disease once and then be done with the story. So what then do we face? So let's look at it. Uh, we will in a year to 18 months have a vaccine. Uh, once the population is vaccinated, that stops the spread of the disease. We will have to vaccinate a large fraction of the population. Some fraction of people will have been infected and become res uh, immune themselves and that will help. But it's not what a vaccine will be. That might be a year or two or more till people are vaccinated. Dr. Kaufman stresses that while waiting 12 to 18 months for vaccines, we must now search for antivirals against COVID-19 that can be in the field much sooner. A first choice is to screen FDA-approved drugs. There, there are undoubtedly thousands of FDA-approved drugs already in the United States. The basic idea is to screen those drugs to see if any of them can act to block COVID-19. I now want to talk about three other approaches to making antivirals. In addition to screening as rapidly as we can for effective drugs among FDA approved drugs or the equivalent in England or whatever, um, there are at least three other approaches to creating antivirals. Let me remind you of what a virus is. It's typically a strand of DNA or RNA that is packaged into a set of proteins that coat it, called the coat. Uh, and a uh, fancy apparatus like a tail fiber. The tail fiber is attached to the cell, your cell, and the virus drills a hole in it and injects its genetic material into the cell. Uh, once the genetic material is into the human cell, the virus genes take over the cell's protein-making machinery and it, it expresses the viral genes, which then reproduce the virus, make the proteins to package it, and there's thousands of viruses in the cell that then burst the cell and spread to other cells. So the first technique that is known for 30 years is called phage display. About 30 years ago, George Smith showed that you could take 100 million uh, phage, all the, the same phage, and use genetic engineering to insert into each phage of 100 million a different little short DNA sequence such that uh, each of the 100 million phage makes uh, a different short sequence of amino acids called a peptide. So now you have what's called a library of 100 million phage. And Smith showed at that point that if you took, in his case, 20 million and asked those 20 million, could any of them bind something? In the case that he was looking at is something called a monoclonal antibody. About one in a million binds. This has been a big thing trying to make drugs for a long time. Here's then the idea. We use phage display, which is available commercially around the world, 
and we screen for phage, whose little peptides bind to the outside of COVID-19, for example, the tail fiber of COVID-19, and block it from binding to human cells and injecting its DNA. This can be done. Uh, I don't know the extent to which it's standing up around the world, but we, we need to do it, and we need to do it not only because we need it now, but we're going to need it during recurrences such as those that are happening in Hong Kong. Uh, and that can now treat patients while we're waiting for the vaccine. The second approach is called monoclonal antibodies. It's been around for 40 years. So when you are infected with a virus, your immune system uh, has what are called B cells in your, in your serum, in your blood. The, each B cell makes a different antibody molecule. And in your immune response, you evolve such that your cells evolve such that there are B cells that make antibodies that bind something on the COVID-19 virus uh, very well, or any other virus. So here is the idea. If one takes patients who have recovered from COVID-19, their blood and serum contains B cells that make antibodies that bind to the COVID-19, for example, the tail fiber. There are perfectly well-established techniques for taking one of those B cells and quotes immortalizing it so that that B cell becomes billions of copies of the same cell, B cell, making billions of copies of those same antibody molecule, which is now called a monoclonal. They've been used for years to treat all kinds of things. Can we hope rapidly to create monoclonals that will bind to COVID-19, for example, the tail fiber, and block it from infecting? And the answer is yes. The third is something called siRNA. SIRNA are short interfering RNA that can be made so the SIRNA can bind to the messenger RNA that will make the coat protein for the virus and that stops the translation making that protein and so it blocks the virus. Efforts are starting up uh, with SIRNA around the world. We need to do everything we can to encourage such efforts on a maximum scale. COVID-19 is currently infecting more than 150,000 Americans and has claimed 2,800 lives in the U.S. alone. To conclude, the researchers represented in this film strongly recommend the following in order to stem the exponential rise of this pandemic. In order to flatten the results to a logistic curve, social distancing must be maintained at 80% or above for an extended period of time. All FDA-approved drugs screen for efficacy alone and in combination, and phage display, monoclonal antibodies, and siRNA strategies prioritized and optimized for potential results. <laughs>